Okay, let's just go to the Lord in prayer. Father, I do want to thank you for this evening, and I do want to thank you for this word, and I thank you that you have been establishing your word in us, line upon line, precept upon precept, and I appreciate your word, Father. I appreciate the things that you've got to say. So, Lord, tonight we ask by your anointing to bring forth your word. For, Lord, I don't lean on me. I lean on you, and I look to you, and we glorify you and magnify you and appreciate you, and we stand on your word, Father. So let it come forth in Jesus' name. Amen. I'm excited about tonight's word because over the last uh, eight weeks uh, and as we have studied this particular series, this, this tonight we have already looked at every single thing that the Bible has to say about homosexuality or that people feel that it says about homosexuality. And so now I want to look at what the Lord is really saying about uh, the gay community and the non-gay community and the church universal and what is the prophetic word that the Lord has for such a time as this. So we don't have to deal tonight with, uh, you know, does Leviticus chapter 20 mean this or mean that or does uh, Sodom and Gomorrah story talking about this group of people or that group of people. But tonight we really can see what the Lord has said and what the Lord is saying to us and what the Lord is trying to get across to the church. And so I want to turn to Ephesians chapter 2. Um, again, I'm, as I say, we're not going to be talking about homosexuality per se because we've looked at everything there is and there just isn't that much to look at. But uh, there is a prophetic word. This particular chapter, Ephesians chapter 2, I find uh, particularly fascinating to me, beginning with verse 11, because the day that this church started, July 6th, 1986. This was the first thing that the Lord brought forth. We opened with a scripture and uh, it was a prophetic scripture. We didn't know that the Lord was going to give us a scripture, but this is the scripture he gave us. And so this scripture upon this particular passage of the word is the foundation upon this church, uh, was the foundation this church was laid upon. And so that's why I think it's very important for us to look at this word. And when we look at this word and realize that this is the word the Lord gave to our church and for this move of God, then we begin to see that there is a parallel in the New Testament between the time that the Gentiles were brought into the Jewish church and today's time when the gay community is brought into the Christian church. So we look at uh, chapter 2 of Ephesians, we begin with verse 11 and it says, therefore, Remember that formerly you the Gentiles in flesh who are called uncircumcision by the so-called circumcision which is performed in the flesh by human hands. Remember that you were at that time separate from Christ, excluded from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers to the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. But now in Christ Jesus, you who formerly were far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ. For he himself is our peace, who made both groups into one and broke down the barrier of the dividing wall by abolishing in his flesh the enmity, which is the law of commandments contained in ordinances, that in himself he might make the two into one new man, thus establishing peace, and might reconcile them both into one body to God through the cross, by it having put to death the enmity. And he came and preached peace to you who were far away, and peace to you, to those who were near. For through him we both have our access in one spirit to the Father. So then you are no longer strangers and aliens, but you are fellow citizens with the saints and are of God's household. Having been built upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Christ Jesus himself being the cornerstone, in whom the whole building being fitted together is growing into a holy temple in the Lord, in whom you also are being built together into a dwelling of God in the Spirit. This is a true word of prophecy to the gay community. When verse 11 says, remember that formerly you the Gentiles, when you read Gentiles, you might as well just plug in gay community. You the gay community in the flesh who are called uncircumcision or uh, outside of the covenant of law, outside of the covenant people of faith which is what is being said today, uh, who were called uncircumcision by the so-called circumcision, which is performed in the flesh by human hands. Remember that you were excluded. You were strangers to the promise, having no hope and without God in the world. And I think that we see much of that. That's probably the majority of the gay community is without hope 
and without God in the world. But, it says, we were brought near in Jesus Christ. We who were far off have been brought near by the blood. And, of course, the blood of Jesus is an established historical fact. So we don't have to wait for, this is an exciting and a good word, we don't have to wait for uh, somebody to give us a stamp of, of approval. We don't have to wait for somebody to catch on. The fact is, God has already established it in the Word 2,000 years ago. So anyone who was afar off has been brought near by the blood of Jesus. He broke down the barrier, verse 14, of the dividing wall. You remember on New Year's Eve, um, I believe it was two years ago, we went to uh, uh, a church in this city and we, went, we were expecting a word from the Lord. And the word that was preached to us was about uh, a climbing vine has in its nature to keep climbing and eventually a climbing vine, no matter how many times it gets torn down and ripped down and, and stomped on, its nature is to continue to climb and eventually a climbing vine will rip apart the mortar in the bricks and the wall will come down that it climbs. And so here we were been praying and praying and praying for God to bring down the walls and the dividing barriers between gay Christians and non-gay Christians and uh, the, the prophetic word came forth that we were climbing vines, that we, it was in our nature, we would keep on climbing, we would keep on climbing, no matter how many times we got ripped down, we would keep on climbing. And, uh, but he did it. We were brought near, he is our peace, he made both groups into one. So as far as the Holy Spirit's concerned and as far as God the Father is concerned, we're already one. It's already established fact. It, uh, it's just simply going to be the Lord now revealing that to the other parts of the body of Christ that they have other parts that they're not aware of so that the whole body can function and flow together. In fact, if you remember, I told you years ago that I had a dream and I was in an auditorium and we couldn't find the separating wall between us and another group. And that Lord, the Lord said in that dream that that's because the dividing wall has been broken down. And I wondered, where was that in the Bible? And here it was. This is the place. So uh, it says in verse 15 that he himself might make the two into one new man, thus establishing peace. Verse 16, might reconcile them both in one body to God through the cross. So it's the cross of Jesus that destroys the enmity and he preaches peace. So we look backward into history and we see that his blood is an established historical fact. So his blood has already brought us near. We look historically backward 2,000 years ago and we see that his cross is a historical fact. Therefore, his cross has already knocked down the dividing wall, which means that we're free to walk in liberty with the rest of the body of Christ, whether they receive uh, the message of the good news or not whether they receive the, the other parts of the body. If the, hands, the eye says to the hand, I have no need of thee, it does not mean that it has no need of thee. And it does not mean that the hand does not exist. The hand does exist, and God made them all into one body. And so um, I think that that's, that's an ex exciting word from the Lord, uh, and that was the word that he gave to our church. Now, initially in the first century church, they were dealing with the issue of whether or not uh, God could call in Gentiles into this Jewish event, this Jewish church. And so we go to uh, Acts chapter 10. We know what story is going to be there, Cornelius. But before Cornelius hears the message, Cornelius the Gentile, the Italian Gentile, before he hears the message of the gospel, God has to work on Peter, the apostle, so that Peter will even be willing to go to a Gentile's house. Right? And so in 10.13, it says, um, uh, well, I'm in 1 Corinthians. I want Acts. I'm sorry. <laughs> I thought, well, that's a good word, but that's not it. <laughs> no temptation has overtaken you, but such is common to man. That's not what I wanted to look at. <laughs> so Acts chapter 10, verse 13, uh, and that says here, uh, Peter is having a vision. And uh, a voice came to him and said, Arise, Peter, kill and eat. And on this sheet that's lowered before him are all four-footed animals, crawling creatures of the earth, birds of the air, everything a good Jew knows by the law he's not allowed to touch. And 
this voice comes and says, Arise, Peter, kill and eat. And Peter said, By no means, Lord, for I have never eaten anything unholy and unclean. And again a voice came to him a second time, What God has cleansed no longer call unholy. Now Peter's pondering this because he's thinking that God is only talking about foods, about Jewish rituals. And God's not talking about foods. God's talking about people. God's talking about people that, that the Jews say are unclean, that the Jews say are untouchable, that the Jews say are not uh, worthy, you can't eat in their house. And by verse 34, Peter suddenly gets the revelation what that uh, sheet being lowered and that vision of all those unclean foods is all about. And he says, and opening his mouth, Peter said, I most certainly understand now that God is not one to show partiality. But in every nation, the one who fears him and does what is right is welcome to him. So God establishes that people are welcome. And he was saying to Peter that what I have cleansed do not call unclean. Interestingly enough, again on a New Year's Eve, we were waiting for the Lord in this church and waiting for a, a word from the Lord. And uh, it was at that time in... Uh, uh, as 1988 was rolling into 1989, that the Lord told us that before March came, we would hear a word from him. And so February 28th of 1989 at 11 o'clock at night, a prophecy came forth over the television airwaves on Christian television. Uh, Benny Hinn was giving the prophecy and he said, that God was going to prove to the church and to the world that he could clean the gay community up. Now here's this same thing, the exact same words, God speaking through Benny Hinn that God spoke to Peter. What I've called clean, what I have cleansed. In other words, he took a people, not a food, a people and cleansed them and then said now that I've cleansed them, don't call them unclean. And it also meant that uh, Peter was not then allowed to uh, try to impose his former traditions onto this new people group that God had grafted in to the kingdom of God. So they weren't going to have to now walk under the laws of Levit Leviticus, which we saw no one was ever able to walk unto, un under anyway. They weren't going to have to try to go into a bondage of Moses. They were going to be in the liberty of the spirit. And uh, so... Verse 44 of Acts 10 goes on, the same story of Cornelius' household. Peter's now in the house with the, with, the, uh, with the Gentiles, and he begins to preach. And he started preaching, and he says, while, it says, verse 44, while Peter was still speaking these words, the Holy Spirit fell upon all those who were listening to the message. And all the circumcised believers, or in other words, all the Jewish believers who had come with Peter were amazed because the gift of the Holy Spirit had been poured out upon the Gentiles also. For they were hearing them speaking with tongues and exalting God. Then Peter answered, surely no one can refuse water for these to be baptized who have received the Holy Spirit just as we did, can he? In other words, to the Jewish believers who were with Peter, the proof that God had accepted them was that God filled them with the Holy Spirit. They were baptized with the Holy Spirit and they began to speak with tongues. That was proof positive that the Holy Spirit had filled them. And that was prior to them saying, well, gee, how can we be a good Jew like you so that we can become holy enough so that God will accept us? And then having accepted us, you know, maybe we can get what you've got. Maybe we can receive Jesus as the Jewish Messiah. They didn't have to do any of that. In fact, the only thing he preaches about Jesus is in verse 38. He says, you know of Jesus of Nazareth, how God anointed him with the Holy Spirit and with power and how he went about doing good and healing all who were oppressed by the devil for God was with him. He didn't say anything about how he made uh, backsliding Jews good Jews. He said he was uh, doing warfare with the devil and setting people free. That's what he said, because he had been anointed by the Holy Spirit and with power. So the criterion to know whether or not God had accepted you was whether or not you'd been filled with the Holy Spirit and whether you're baptized in the Holy Spirit. I have heard many a preacher in my short Christian walk uh, say that, you know, if you get cleaned up, you might get the Holy Ghost. Well, the Holy Ghost comes to clean us up. The Cornelius didn't get cleaned up first and then get the Holy Ghost. He got the Holy Ghost, then he got cleaned up. 
And God said through Benny Hinn that he was going to prove to the world and to the church that he could clean up the gay community. Not that the gay community was going to clean themselves up. God was going to do it. And then as God began to deal with the gay community, little by little by little by little, their standards began to raise and began to raise and began to raise to be the standard of the word. And they began to understand that the, the, same, uh, the same standard of living uh, in the word for a heterosexual couple is the same standard of living in the word for a gay couple. That God is no respecter of persons, Peter says. I certainly understand that God is not one to show partiality. So what he does in one group, he does with the other because he makes them all one. They're all one thing. There's not uh, two different churches. There's not two different Holy Spirits. There's not two different ways to get saved. There's only one Holy Spirit. There's only one Father. There's only one kingdom of God. So, but just because in Acts chapter 10, 44 to 47, the Holy Ghost falls on the Gentiles, and just because they get baptized and they become spirit-filled believers does not mean that everyone in the church was willing to have open arms and to embrace them. In fact, as soon as Peter gets back to Jerusalem, chapter 11 turns out, it says, uh, uh, verse 2, when Peter came up to Jerusalem, those who were circumcised took issue with him. So right away a debate ensues. Look, what do you think you're doing? Uh, saying, you went to uncircumcised men and ate with them. What do you think you're doing, God? even talking to those people, much less eating with them? But Peter began speaking and proceeded to explain to them in an orderly sequence saying, and he goes on to tell how God had prepared his heart. Verse 9, he says, a voice from heaven answered a second time, what God has cleansed no longer call unholy. He begins to really explain again and again and again the different things that God had done. By the time he gets to verse 15, he says, and as I began to speak, Peter's telling when he was preaching in this Gentile household, as I began to speak, the Holy Spirit fell on them, just as he did upon us at the beginning. And I remembered the word of the Lord, how he used to say, John baptized with water, but you shall be baptized with the Holy Spirit. If God therefore gave them the same gift as he gave to us also, after believing in the Lord Jesus Christ, who was I that I could stand in God's way? And when they heard this, they quieted down and glorified God, saying, well then, God has granted to the Gentiles also the repentance that leads to life. Well, the same fact is true about the gay community. Is the Lord has the word preached in the gay community, and the Lord baptizes them with the Holy Spirit and gives to the gay community the same gift as he gives to the non-gay community after believing in the Lord Jesus Christ. Who is it that's going to stand in God's way? You see? Uh, and they quieted down. And so actually the church ought to start quieting down any moment now. <laughs> they ought to. <laughs> if they know the word, if they understand the word and the concept of the word here. Um, but years elapse. And after this has occurred, um, Paul becomes an evangelist. He goes out on an evangelist to journey with Barnabas and they go from town to town and they establish churches and they begin to uh, put elders in place and so all these things start taking place and, and uh, so years have gone by, years have elapsed after the Gentiles had received the Holy Spirit and there's still a debate raging. Interesting because Acts 15 um, we are now talking, Acts 15 doesn't tell you, you have to go into uh, Acts 14 to find out, but we're looking at the church at Antioch, which is primarily a non-Jewish church, because in Antioch they were first called Christians, not, the, not completed Jews or Messianic Jews or other kinds of Jews. It wasn't a sect of Judaism anymore. Now they're called Christ followers or Christians. And so... It says, uh, so we're looking at the church at Antioch, verse 1 of Acts 15. And some men came down from Judea and began teaching the brethren, unless you are circumcised according to the custom of Moses, you cannot be saved. So the, re the, the debate is still raging, just like it is today in, 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 the, uh, in many quarters. 
of, uh, of the traditional church, you are still hearing people say uh, that unless they become heterosexuals, they can't be saved. Or unless they become celibate homosexuals, they can't be saved on the way to being restored to their heterosexuality. Same issue here. Unless you become circumcised and begin to follow all of the law of Moses, you cannot be saved. So there are Jews who still equate, uh, who still equate salvation with works of your own. That you can only get in when you work it up, you do it right, you get things together. When you get things together, then God will give you his Holy Ghost, he'll give you salvation, he'll give you the kingdom of God. But that's not what God has done. God did a sovereign work as he explained to Peter, I've cleansed what I've cleansed. Don't you call unholy. Don't you set up the criteria by which to judge. In fact, doesn't the word go throughout many, many books of the New Testament say, don't judge unless you'll be judged in that very same way. You know, Matthew 7 is only one place in the Gospels, but also many places in the, in the epistles also we're told not to judge the brethren, not to judge the church, you know, uh, unless we're going we're gonna to fall under the same condemnation. Romans 2 goes into the same kind of issue. Many other places in the Word say the same thing. So we don't set up other laws by which other people get saved. We point people to the Savior. Then it says... Uh, and when Paul and Barnabas had great dissension and debate with them, the brethren determined that Paul and Barnabas and others of them should go up to Jerusalem to the apostles and elders concerning this issue. So they really decided that it's really necessary. This is such a big issue as today it's a big issue. Um, uh, you know, I'm just reminded of a pastor that I talked to not too long ago here in Dayton who told me that she really felt that this was probably going to be the same, the same uh, caliber of issue as slavery was in the 1850s for churches, that churches split over the issue of slavery, that this, you know, uh, that this is that kind of an issue, that big of an issue. Um, I hope not, because the cross has already brought us together. The blood has already brought us near. And so if people choose to make it that big of an issue, they're only doing it out of disobedience to loving their neighbor as themselves and to the commandments of God that we have as Christians. Nonetheless, look in verse 5. Uh, or four, when they arrived in Jerusalem, they were received by the church. So now Barnabas and Paul are there to ask the elders and the apostles what they believe. They reported all that God had done with them, which I mean was raising up churches and seeing God move and God do mighty things and baptize church after church after church after church all throughout, you know, the known world. So they reported the things and that the church in Antioch is alive and well and, and spirit filled and you know, mighty works of God taking place. So they're reporting those are the things that God had done. The same things that confirmed that God was at work. The same signs that showed Jesus was doing the works of his Father. Those were the things that they were reporting. But, verse 5 said, certain ones of the sect of the Pharisees. So it's always the Pharisees. Um, the ones who are so religious but stuck in their laws and in their traditions. So that's why we're looking at traditions, how traditions get people really stuck. And that's what happened to Pharisees. They were stuck with the traditions. The Pharisees who believed stood up saying, it is necessary to circumcise them and to direct them to observe the law of Moses. And verse 7 said, after there had been much debate. So now this debate has moved uh, it started in Jerusalem, goes out to Antioch, comes back to Jerusalem. This debate is not resolved, even though it's taken years, years for this uh, debate to be looked at. In verse 8, uh, they're giving testimony. Uh, Peter begins to give testimony to what he remembers now. Back to Acts chapter 10 when he was in the household of Cornelius. He says, And God who knows the heart bore witness to them, meaning the Gentiles at Cornelius' house, giving them the Holy Spirit just as he did to us. And he made no distinction between us and them, cleansing their hearts by faith. Now why do you put God to the test by placing upon the neck of the disciples a yoke which neither our fathers nor we have been able to bear? 
but we believe that we are saved through the grace of the Lord Jesus in the same way as they also are. So Peter was now convinced there's only one way you get saved. It's not by becoming a heterosexual. It's not by becoming a Jew. It's not by following Moses or looking at Leviticus and trying to follow all the ritualistic laws. It is, in fact, by believing through the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ. That's the only way that they were getting saved. Then James, verse 13 says, he begins to speak, and he says, listen to me. Now James, when James would speak, everyone would listen. James, number one, had been a brother, a half-brother of Jesus Christ. He lived in the same household from the day he was born. He was raised by the same mother uh, uh, and same father that Jesus was raised by and uh, was raised in the same household. He saw Jesus from the day that he was born. He knew Jesus Christ intimately. And James was the one who became the pastor, the senior pastor of the church of Jerusalem, which was the mother church of the birth of this whole new move in the earth called Christianity. So when James speaks, everyone listens to what he has to say. And that's why I think this is so important. Because what he says is not what you think he's going to say. James says, listen to me, verse 13. Then he says, Simeon has related how God first concerned himself about taking from among the Gentiles a people for his name. So God concerned himself. It was God's concern to take a people from a people who were not a people and bring them in by the blood. That was God's concern. And look at verse 15, 16, and 17, because these verses are so unusual that it catapults us into a whole other topic. Because it's so, and you can't understand what God was doing and how God's going to do what he's going to do in this generation without understanding what he's speaking here. So he goes on and says, just as the prophets agree, just as it is written. Now, don't look at that just yet, because I want to tell you what you might think he would say. You might think he would say, just as the prophets agree, just as it is written, those who believe on the Lord shall be saved. Uh, what does the Lord require of thee, O Israel, but to do justice and mercy and, uh, uh, you know, what does the Lord require of your hand? I delight in, uh, in mercy rather than in sacrifice. You would think that God would say things like that. Uh, to show that God would bring in anybody who was interested in seeking God. Those who hunger and thirst after righteousness shall be saved or shall be filled. Uh, those who seek me early shall find me. Lots of things that, that, that James could have drawn from in the Old Testament to have shown that God would pull a people for himself. But instead, he pulls a prophecy from an obscure prophet named Amos, in Amos chapter 9, he pulls out this uh, obscure prophecy about the tabernacle of David. Just as the prophets agree, just as it is written, verse 16, after these things I will return and I will rebuild the tabernacle of David which has fallen and I will rebuild its ruins and I will restore it in order that the rest of mankind may seek the Lord and all the Gentiles who are called by my name says the Lord who makes these things known from of old interesting word interesting word the um, and it really makes you stop and you think now what on earth it almost looks like James is about to say something profound and then switches the topic. And you, you almost read this. I imagine most people, most Christians read this and think, well, I don't know what that is. And you just go right on and ignore or don't grasp what it is that James is prophetically speaking about the church. He is saying that God will rebuild the tabernacle of David, which is fallen. And rebuilding the tabernacle of David, which has fallen, is a direct link. It's a direct uh, relationship to talking about bringing in those into the fold who were not in the fold. Now, it doesn't seem to make any sense unless we understand the tabernacle of David. Well, the tabernacle of David is interesting uh, that God would pick that. That's what he prophesies 
about the tabernacle of David. This is a direct quote. I will rebuild the tabernacle of David which has fallen. I will rebuild its ruins. I will restore it in order that the rest of mankind may seek the Lord. Well, first of all, God does not say, I will rebuild the tabernacle of Moses. Had he been saying, I will rebuild the tabernacle of Moses, then he would have been saying, I will reinstitute the law. Because the tabernacle of Moses was the first tabernacle. It was the first tent that God had built. He had Moses instructed in the very exact measurements of the tabernacle, the fabric that was to be used, the porpoise skin, the colors that it needed to be dyed, everything that went into it, and in it were the uh, two tablets that God had written the law on. It was the uh, rod of Aaron that had budded. It was a jar of the manna. All of those things were held and kept in the tabernacle of Moses. And within the tabernacle of Moses, nobody could approach God. Nobody except the high priest once a year in order to make atonement for the sins of the people. In fact, it was such a precarious thing that if the high priest had not followed the law exactly, once he got into the Holy of Holies inside the tabernacle, he would have been struck dead if he had any sin or any mistake. And they used to tie a rope around the waist of the high priest in case he did get struck dead because he was the only one allowed in there, no one else could go in and get his body. So with a rope around his waist, in case he made a mistake, they could then pull his corpse out from the tabernacle. And God did not say he would, re he would reinstitute the tabernacle of Moses, which was the place of the law. And it was also the place where Israel met God, but they couldn't approach unto God. He did not also say he did not he did not also say he would reinstitute the tabernacle of Solomon or the tabernacle of Nehemiah or the tabernacle of Herod which Herod rebuilt once Nehemiah's ta uh, temple was in ruins so there are several tabernacles that God could have said I will rebuild the tabernacle of Nehemiah in fact, to the Nehemiah, it was prophesied that, that do, you, do you remember the former house and how does it seem to you compared to this little piddly thing you've just been working on? Doesn't this little piddly thing seem as if nothing and yet my glory will make this thing much more magnificent than the former temple, God said to Nehemiah and to encourage them as they were building the temple again. Well, but the tabernacle of David was not physically present. It wasn't like you could find the fabric and you could, you know, restitch it and, and hem it up or patch it up or do anything like that. So, first of all, there was the tabernacle of Moses, which was where the law was kept, and it was a tent. And it used to travel wherever Israel traveled. Now, there came a time in Israel's history when they fell into disobedience. They were already in the time of the judges, they already were in the promised land, they already lived in covenant with God in their promised land, but they were not obeying God. As a result, God had one of their enemies, the Philistines, rise up against them. The Philistines went to war with Israel and won the battle. In the process of winning the battle, they captured the ark, the tabernacle of Moses. They captured it and they took it uh, captive to one of their Philistine cities. And because their god was named Dagon, they thought that Dagon was a bigger and more powerful god than the god of Israel. Therefore, they brought in the tabernacle of Moses into the temple of Dagon as a sacrifice to Dagon to say, look, Dagon, our wonderful god, look what we have done for you. Look what we have got for you. We've captured the god of Israel. Of course, Dagon was a statue. Dagon couldn't speak, Dagon couldn't move, and in the morning when the priest of Dagon went in to worship him, he was fallen on his face before the ark of the God of Israel. In fact, his nose broke off, and they had to pick him back up, and you know, had to try to piece him back together, and he couldn't say a thing about it. He couldn't even say, ouch, he was just a big old idol. He was nothing. They, they put him back in place and, you know, secured him. And the next morning, the priest of Dagon come back in and God's knocked him over again and his head's off and his hands are off. So now he doesn't even have any hands. He doesn't have any head. He can't do a thing. He can't say a thing. He can't see a thing. He can't speak a thing. He can do nothing. 
and God begins to pour out plagues on the Philistine lords, and one Philistine lord after another says, we don't want it in our city. Hey, uh, why don't you guys take it? And so they take the ark to another city until the ark of God has gone through several cities in Philistine, and each time God hits them with hemorrhoids and boils and cancers and all kinds of things, and they just go, get this thing out of here. Send it back to Israel. Well, they send it back to Israel, and they recognize that that God of Israel is bigger than their God. And they send the tabernacle of Moses back to Israel, but there's no king in Israel. And so because there's no king yet, Saul's not yet anointed as king, there is no king, they don't know exactly where to put this thing, so they just let it sit in someone's farm uh, in their, in their, this, so this guy has this thing for like 20 years. And his house is blessed, and his property is blessed, and I mean, God just keeps blessing and pouring out blessing, and, and all these exciting things are happening. Well, 20 years go by, a number of years go by, finally David comes to the throne of Israel. And David remembers the ark, and he thinks he, it, he ought to bring it into Jerusalem, where the people of God are. He wants to put it on Mount Zion, which is the highest point, so that no matter where you are, outside of Jerusalem or the environs, you can look up and you will see the Lord because you will see his tabernacle. But instead of just seeing the tabernacle of Moses, which was about the size of a coffin, it wasn't a very big uh, uh, box and a very big thing uh, that the tabernacle itself was. So he pitched a greater tent outside of that. That was the tabernacle of David, which was the, 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 uh, the tent outside of the tent that Moses thing sat in. And David instructed 120 singers and they began to have shifts so that 24 hours a day, round the clock, nonstop, in the tabernacle of David, praises and worship and songs and psalms and spiritual hymns went up to the Lord in nonstop worship. So that in the tabernacle of David, the tabernacle of David institutes a brand new concept that David discovered as a shepherd boy on the hills of Judea when he began to just play skillfully to the Lord. In fact, he was so good at it that when Saul had disobeyed God and Saul had an evil spirit, the only thing that would release him from the evil spirit was to go get that little shepherd boy off the hills of Judea to bring his harp and to play skillfully songs of praise and worship to the Lord, which are our psalms today. And as he would sing those psalms, the evil spirit would depart from Saul. Why is that? Why is that? Well, because of two reasons. Number one is... Psalm 22 verse 3 says God inhabits the praises of his people. As long as David had praises going up to God continually 24 hours a day, God was inhabiting those praises. And as God was inhabiting those praises, then you had um, victory in the camp of Israel again and again and again and again and again. People would remember the Lord, think about the Lord, declare his wondrous works, declare who he was, give testimony to one another, sing back and forth to one another about the great things that God had done, the great things that uh, God was up to. So, and Psalm 5 verse 4, which David wrote, said, evil, O Lord, does not dwell with thee. The word for evil in Strong's is 7451. It's the word ra, and it means this is what does not dwell with God. Anything that's bad, anything of inferior quality, anything malignant, anything that's noxious, anything injurious, anything hurtful, anything giving pain, anything causing unhappiness, any kind of adversity or any kind of calamity. It says that does not dwell with thee. Well, the word to dwell, 1481 in Strong's, means to sojourn, to take up one's abode, to dwell, to remain, or to gather. In other words, where God is, evil cannot be. And since God inhabits the praises of his people, God is in those praises. 
And so if the people of God have something malignant or something injurious or something hurtful or something that causes unhappiness or something inferior in their life, as they began to praise and to worship and to magnify and to glorify the Lord, as they continued walking on and walking on and walking on and praising Him and magnifying His name, that which was evil could not continue in the journey because it could not continue in the journey where God was. And so that which was injurious had to fall by the wayside, just like Dagon fell over. It could not stay with God. Now, the Lord told us, this local assembly, to worship Him daily. Why? Because... After these things I will return and I will rebuild the tabernacle of David. You see, if you begin to worship him when you wake up, but you wake up an hour earlier than the next person wakes up, and then the next person wakes up an hour later, and then somebody else doesn't have time when they first get up, so at lunchtime they begin to praise him, and somebody else begins to think about it at dinner time, or somebody else begins to think about it as they meditate on their bed before they go to sleep for the night. You've got people all through the day beginning to worship him, to praise him, to exalt him, to glorify him. And while that's happening with each individual member of the church, at the same time, the local assembly then, therefore, is beginning to reinstitute the tabernacle of David. And in that tabernacle, evil does not dwell. Now, it says, I will rebuild its ruins and I will restore it. That does not mean he's going to then put a big tent on Mount Zion because he's not talking about fabric just like he's not talking about food when he said to Peter kill and eat what I've cleansed don't call unclean he's not talking about the fabric of the tent he's talking about the praise and all that the tabernacle uh, proclaimed and all that the, pro the tabernacle of David instituted had he was if he was just interested in reinstituting a structure why not the tabernacle or the tent or the temple of Solomon it was the most magnificent the grandest the most beautiful thing in the world why not reinstitute that and all of us go to Jerusalem and, and be in awe of this building these stones and this brick and this mortar and this cedar and this, you know, uh, the cedars of Lebanon and all of the woods and all of the things, the gold and the, and the cherubims and, and all of the, uh, the instruments and all. Why not ha rebuild that? Because that's not what he's interested in. There were many times in the temple of Solomon that there were wicked kings in Jerusalem who forgot all about God and that building just stood there and nothing happened. But in the tabernacle of David, the whole time that it was standing, nonstop worship took place. Now that's what God's saying he's doing. He's going to reinstitute nonstop worship in the church. Then it says, uh, I will restore it in order that the rest of mankind may seek the Lord. Why would the rest of the human race seek the Lord if the tabernacle of David is restored? Well, I think it's pretty clear. If the tabernacle of David is reinstituted, the tabernacle of David, meaning that the people of God have nonstop worship going on all the time, then that means the, pra the, the praises of God going up. God inhabits those praises, and so God inhabits the church nonstop, meaning evil's not able to dwell with the church and the world who's in dire straits, who have no answers, who have a lot of facts but no truth, who have lots of evil reports and no good news, no gospel, suddenly look to the light of the world and suddenly look to the salt of the earth and say, look at the magnificent things going on there. Do you know that people will fly halfway around the world in, if they think there's a cure for what ails them? Rock Hudson died not in the United States but in Paris because he had hoped that there was something happening in Paris that could help him keep him alive. 
People will travel to the ends of the earth if they think that there's something that will help them. And they don't care if you talk in tongues. They don't care if you do something silly. They don't care if you dance in the aisles. All they care about is they hurt and they know that this is the place that they can be healed. There is a balm in Gilead. God is still on the throne. He wants to flow through his people. And in this generation, we've only seen God flow in a limited measure. But the reason we've only seen God flow in a limited measure is because the body is not coming together to worship him in one accord. Now, we look at Ephesians chapter 2, which was the original, uh, the original scripture that God gave to this church. And that second chapter of the book of Ephesians ends with these words. Looking at, look at the verse 19 to the end. So you are no longer strangers and aliens, but you are fellow citizens with the saints and are of God's household. Having been built upon the foundation of the apostles and the prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the cornerstone. The cornerstone of what? The temple. Know ye not, know ye not, you are the temple in whom the whole building being fitted together is growing into a holy tabernacle, into a holy temple in the Lord in whom you also, he's talking to the Gentiles, those who were not included, you also are being built together into a dwelling of God in the Spirit. My contention is, yes, as believers in Jesus Christ, we can lay hands on the sick and they can recover. And my contention is that, yes, as believers in the Lord Jesus Christ, if a member of the local assembly is sick and they will obey the word and they will call for the elders of the church, the elders of the church can lay hands on the sick and they will recover. Now that's a recovery room. These signs shall follow those that believe. They lay hands on the sick and the sick recover. That's a recovery room. That is not how, those are healings that take place, but those are gradual healings. They're not, the, because recovery is you go to surgery and after the, the second the surgery is done, as soon as you've been stitched back up, you're better. But you don't feel better. And you go to the recovery room and while you're in the recovery room, you start to become ungroggy and you need a pain shot. And as soon as, because though you are healed, you're all done, but you still feel lousy. You might need uh, a little emesis basin. You might need a lot of things before you actually are willing to go home. You don't go from the operating table to your house. There's not a cab waiting outside the operating room to take you home. You're in the recovery mode. And many people lose it right there because they say, hey, I, I, I need a pain shot, therefore I didn't get it, and therefore I'm still sick. And they, they don't walk by faith, they walk by sight, they look at the recovery, they look at the scar, and they say, I'm not healed. By his stripes, I'm not healed. It didn't work. It's not working for me. So they go right back into the operating room. Or worse yet, they just rip open their stitches and they just go ahead and get an infection. The Bible says that the, God sent his word and healed them. But the Bible also says that the sower sows the seed. The seed is the word. God sent his word. The sower sows the word. As soon as the word is sown, what happens? Satan immediately comes to snatch that word. Immediately. So if people had a sign, they had a symptom, they had a disease, they had a process, and the word went into their spirit and they received their healing, Boom, Satan comes in to steal that. However, so we see limited successes because of a variety of factors in the body of Christ. We don't see everything the Word says. It says the Lord had compassion on the multitudes and he healed them all. When can the Lord have compassion on the whole city of Dayton and heal all of them? When the tabernacle is reinstituted. When the body of Christ starts acting like a body instead of an eye saying to a hand, I don't need you. While the eye is still saying to the hand, I don't need you, the eye is performing its own surgery instead of performing worship that it is called to do. The body, the Jesus said to the body of Christ that greater works would we do than he did. Why? Because there'd be more of us 
For one thing, we would encompass the entire earth. He could only walk the hillside of Judea or Galilee or Nazareth or Capernaum. But we can be everywhere at all times, at all places, filled with the Holy Spirit. The proof in the Bible that God has accepted a people was that they were filled with the Holy Spirit. They were filled with the Holy Spirit. And as soon as they're filled with the Holy Spirit, there's no more argument. There is nothing more you can say. There's no more laws you can impose to say, well now, all right, you're talking in tongues, but you need to do this and this and this and this. No, God has cleansed. What God has cleansed, no longer call unclean. No wonder Satan is so uh, diligent in his war against the gay community because it's the last remnant of folks that need to be brought into the body. It's the last group of people whom the blood has also brought in. It's the last group of people whom the cross has also destroyed the enmity between two other groups, making both groups one. No wonder the enemy is so hard at work to keep this severed and separated so that the, he knows that if the body comes together and the body is one unified body, exalts and glorifies and magnifies Jesus, Jesus in his fullness, not in his limited measure, but in his fullness is able to move through the earth. Now that's what the Lord's been speaking. No wonder, you know, we don't see everything happen we want to see happen. But it doesn't mean God doesn't want to do it. It doesn't, mean that, uh, it doesn't mean that God can't do it. It doesn't mean he's not willing. It doesn't mean his heart isn't breaking, trying to get it to happen. But it re depends on us. And if we will have ears to hear what the Spirit's saying to the church, if we will at any cost walk in unity, then the most that we can do, we can be held, we have, we'll still be held accountable and we'll still be held responsible for whether we walk in love. And just because someone else won't do it, and just because someone else won't walk in love, doesn't mean that we're off the hook. We are still, we are still held accountable to do it. And if we're, to what degree we will obey the Lord, to what degree we will obey the Lord, what does Isaiah 119 say? It says that if you want to, uh, just turn there real quick, in Isaiah chapter 1, this is the very beginning, it says this, verse 19, if you are willing and you obey, you will eat the best of the land. So in other words, even though the rest of the body might not be in a cooperative mode, you still have the ability to eat the best. You still have the ability in your household, in your own life, in your physical body. John said in 3 John 2, Beloved, I wish above all else that you may prosper and that you may be in health even as your soul prospers. So as long as we're willing to let our soul prosper, as long as we're willing to take responsibility for ourselves in growing in the Lord and obeying the Lord and not only obeying Him but being willing to obey Him. That's a twofold obligation on our part. We don't do it just kicking the rocks and grumbling the whole way. We do it saying, thank you, Father, you've given me something to do. Thank you, Father. What does the word say? Rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I say rejoice. It is high time for the church to take seriously what God says. And it is high time for the church to do what he says to do. Not just be a, a, a hearer of the word only, but a doer of the word also. So we can, we can hold ourselves accountable for what we see happening in our local assembly. But if we want to see God do things in those who are not under our covering, if we want to see God do things so that raw, evil, bad, inferior quality, malignant, noxious, injurious, hurtful, painful, unhappiness uh, producing, adversity, uh, calamitous things are removed from the church, then we've got to walk in unity with the church. We have to. Therefore, you know, uh, Jesus prayed that very prayer for that reason. He prayed that prayer in John 17. I believe it's verse 20. I'll turn there very quickly. In John 17, this, the whole thing is known as the high priestly prayer of Jesus. 
In verse 20, he says, I do not ask in behalf of these alone, meaning just those 12 disciples, but for those also who believe in me through their word. Verse 21, that they may all be one, even as thou, Father, art in me and I in thee, that they also, all of them, may be in us, that the world may believe that thou didst send me. When the church sets its heart on being in one accord to the same degree that Jesus was in one accord with the Father, the world will have worldwide revival because they can't help but to believe that God sent Jesus. And I believe this is the generation that's getting that message. In fact, denominational barriers that were erected 200 years ago are now coming down. It wasn't uh, too long ago that I read a story about people in prison in Siberia in communist Russia. That Pentecostals and Baptist and Greek Orthodox clergy were all in prison together for having shared their faith. And before they were in prison, the Baptists were not interested in the Greek Orthodox because they were too liturgical. They didn't care for all that incense and all those robes and all those high hats and all those crosses and crucifix and icons and all of that. The Pentecostals weren't interested in what the Baptists were interested in because the Baptists wouldn't talk in tongues. But you throw them all into prison and suddenly they had to join together in unity. And they began to pray for one another and with one another. And suddenly the love that flowed between them melted all of those barriers. How is it that the church will begin to flow in love? How is it that the church will begin to do the things that Jesus tells them to do? He knew that it wouldn't be by our just saying, well, you know, hey, I don't care what denomination you belong to. Why don't you just uh, come on over here and fellowship with us and we'll fellowship with you. It won't happen that way. How will it happen? He's going to reinstitute the tabernacle of David. It will be through praise and through worship that the body of Christ will come back together. No wonder we say in this church Sunday after Sunday, has anybody brought a psalm? Has anybody brought a song? Has anybody brought a scripture? Has anybody brought anything? Because we're looking for the different parts of the body to come together to reinstitute the tabernacle. We want each part to be the part fitly joined together. So what has the Lord been saying to you through the week? Speaking to one another in psalms, hymns, spiritual songs, singing and making melody with our heart to the Lord, always giving thanks for all things in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ to God, even the Father, and being subject to one another in the fear of Christ. That's being continually filled with the Spirit. That's the definition according to Ephesians 5. So we, we find it necessary for us to flow together in worship. What happens when you worship? When you really enter into worship, when you really set your heart on touching the Father's heart, it doesn't make any difference anymore if the person next to you has a long hairdo or a short hairdo, if they've got on blue jeans or an expensive dress, it doesn't make any difference if they're in high heels or makeup or, or if they're, uh, they really smell like they've just come off the streets because that's where they live. It doesn't make any difference who they are, what their social status is, what their income is. It doesn't make any difference who is that person on your right or on your left. It doesn't make any difference when you truly enter into worship and your heart is set on one thing, Jesus Christ, and touching the Father's heart. When you're set on touching the Father's heart, all the peripheral things, whether you're Baptist, whether you're Pentecostal, whether you're a Methodist, whether you talk in tongues or whether you don't talk in tongues, or whether you believe in healing or don't believe in healing, or you believe in this or you don't believe in that, you soon believe in them because as we enter into worship, God begins to manifest himself and he begins to do a sovereign work. People get healed without anybody laying hands on them as the Holy Spirit moves because he inhabits those praises. That's what would happen in Catherine Kuhlman services by the thousands. She simply would work with word of knowledge. She didn't operate uh, with gifts of healings or uh, with miracles. She operated by word of knowledge or word of wisdom. She would simply say, someone over here is being healed of cancer. 
Someone over here uh, has polio. Sir, take your braces off and come down here. And they would do it because they would witness immediately that was what was happening. The, the, the uh, lame legs were being made whole. The deaf ears were being unstopped. The blinded eyes were being opened. In our generation, this has occurred as Catholics and Methodists and Presbyterians and Baptists and Lutherans and unbelievers and Pentecostals and anything else under the sun got into one place in one accord and began to sing, How great thou art. How great thou art. Their heart and their mind was only focused on one thing, not, well, little girl's got crutches. I wonder what's the matter with her. They were thinking about him, about him. And as they all began to think about him, the little girl with crutches took the crutches off and began to run down the aisles. God wants to rebuild the tabernacle so that the rest of mankind will seek the Lord. So he told us, worship him daily. He told us, God said he'd clean us up. He told us, proofs in the Holy Ghost. We're not going to debate God. We're not going to fight with God. But we're going to set our heart on being a people who will say, whatever you say, whatever you say, Father, we're going to do it. In Jesus' name, praise the Lord. Amen. And he said, take hold of my covenant and I will be your God. Take hold of my covenant and with the angels cry, if you will keep my Sabbath and please me in your ways, I'll be your God and add unto you many, many days. Take hold of my covenant 